Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Care for Creation, Grace for the Heart and Soul, Faith Formation Afternoon. I'll invite you all to place yourself in the presence of God as we will read from the sacred scriptures. Let us begin as we always do with God's great sign of love for all of us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth Put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth Bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, 
Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude, and on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. All-powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And at this point, we will read the treaty acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Treaty 6 territory on which we stand is an ancestral land of the indigenous peoples and is common home to everyone in virtue of God, our Creator's gracious gift. Friends, I now invite you to share in our presentation for Grace for the Heart and Soul by Father Glenn MacDonald. Enjoy. Hello, my friends. My name is Father Glenn MacDonald, and it is my great joy to be with you today to talk about grace. Why grace? Well, I love talking about grace because it is the theological word that we use for God's love. And love is the best topic in the world to talk about. So, how are we going to share about God's love, grace? Well, there are three topics I'd like to zero in on. The first topic is the Trinity. So the Trinity is the theological word we use to describe who God is. A communion of love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who are one because they are love itself. The next topic is types of grace. So grace is the love of the Trinity shared with you and with me. There are four kinds of grace, but I'm only going to talk about three. Actual grace, habitual grace, and sacramental graces. The fourth one, which is a pretty big topic in itself, is called uh, charisms. Then the last topic is the vulnerable. Why would I want to talk about the vulnerable? Well, in the spiritual life, God tends to use vulnerable people as a doorway for us to encounter God's love. And I want to do, I'm going to share with you an interview I did with a lovely woman named uh, Muando, who's the new director of L'Arche. And L'Arche is a beautiful community that uh, strives to help persons with disabilities to live in community and to flourish as human beings. And interacting with them helps um, those who do so to discover their own beautiful humanity at the same time. It's awesome. So let us begin. The Trinity. Now, admittedly, 
The Trinity is a tricky topic to discuss because it can get very philosophical and theoretical and boring um, pretty quickly. So the best way to talk about the Trinity, I find, is through the use of icons. Um, and so this icon is called the Rublev icon. So just to kind of set the scene, on the left you see three persons seated around a table. On the left hand side you have God the Father. In the middle you have the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God, who became incarnate and we know as Jesus. And then on the right hand side we have the Holy Spirit. So with this image in mind then, there are three key ideas to help us capture or help us to go deeper, I should say, into the mystery of the Trinity. Because the Trin God is beyond our understanding. We can never fully capture who God is. But there are a few key ideas that can help us to know if something is of God or not. So those three ideas are openness, relationship, and justice. If something is to be of God or to, if we want to know is this an experience of God's love or not, there has to be openness, relationship, and justice. Without them, not of God. Okay, so the first topic, openness. So you can see the, the idea of the openness of the Trinity when you look at the eyes of the three persons in the icon. Take a look for a moment and notice where are the eyes looking? So you probably see that, like if you start in the middle with the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God, Jesus, his eyes are looking to the left to see, uh, and they're fixed on God the Father. We hear about this all the time in the Gospels, about how Jesus has come to do the will of his Father. And we also hear the idea of how Jesus is the image of the Father. Next, if you look at God the Father, who's on the left, his eyes are looking across to the right at the Holy Spirit. And the God the Father, we, we hear so often in the Gospels, sends out the Holy Spirit with Jesus to go and to um, encounter others, to gather the us, <laughs> to gather the lost, the, the forsaken, the sinful, the, so that they may be drawn into the communion of love. And this is why the Holy Spirit's eyes are looking down at the meal of the table. Why at the meal? Well, if you look you know, at the table, there's a gap there, there or a space at the table. And that space is for you and for me. Very often in our lives, it is the Holy Spirit that we encounter first. And the Holy Spirit stirs us to, and, and draws us to the table, to the communion of love, so that we may encounter Jesus, and then through Jesus, we may encounter His Father. So openness is a, is a key way to discern if we are encountering the love of God because Jesus' eyes are always fixed on the Father and the Father's looked eyes are fixed on the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's eyes are fixed on how to help draw us into the communion of love. I highlight this because it, it could be tempting to think that the, the love of the Trinity is sort of closed off from other people. No, that's the love of God is always a love that is meant to be shared with other people. So each person of the Trinity is always looking to be of service to each other, but it's also a love that is open to inviting others into the communion of love. So now the second piece, relationship. Relationship is inextricably linked to who God is. If something is labeled as God's love but cuts us off from relationship with other people, 
not of God, not of God. And the way we can uh, highlight this is through the names that we use for the Trinity. So we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But when you say God the Father, God the Father of whom? Or God the Son, the Son of whom? Or the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of what? Or in this case, of whom? You cannot understand the Father without thinking about the Father's relationship with the Son and the Holy Spirit. Or you cannot understand who Jesus is without pondering his relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And you cannot understand the Holy Spirit without pondering the Spirit's relationship of the Father and the Son. So the concept of relationship then is absolutely essential to our understanding of who God is. Without, without that openness to relationship, we cannot have God. It, or put more phrase differently, something is not of God if it doesn't have that openness to greater relationship. But this leads then to the, a very important um, aspect of the Trinity, the third topic justice. Now, openness and relationship are wonderful if they are used properly. Um, but sadly, <laughs> we probably have had moments in our lives where our openness to a deeper relationship with someone else was misused. And when that happens, we know this is not of God. This is not God's love. The, the Trinity is a community that is perfectly just. The openness and relationship that each of the persons has to one another and to its re the Trinity's relationship with others, all of creation, is upheld by justice itself. The Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, will always act in the best interests of the other to help them to flourish and to grow. And so if we want to know if something is of God, justice has to be there because without it, the openness and relationship that the love of God can create can become misused, distorted, hurtful. So. We are, here are, these are the three key aspects of the Trinity um, that help us to discern and not only understand who God is, but to discern if something is of the love of God or not. It leads to greater openness, greater relationship, and is marked by justice. So with that brief <laughs> Uh, highlights of the mystery of the Trinity in mind, that leads to our second major topic, which is grace or types of grace. So to make this a little more, mm, well, interesting, to be honest, I'd like to use some uh, examples from scripture and from pop culture to, uh, to highlight um, the different types of grace. So the first, um, in particular, I'll start with what's called actual grace and habitual grace. So to do that, I want to use um, two examples that mirror each other. So the first is the Mandalorian, which you might have heard is a Star Wars character that is now on the Disney Plus series uh, that you can watch. And it's really cool. <laughs> it's really awesome. And it, the life of the Mandalorian is a great example of actual grace. And St. Joseph is a great example of someone who has experienced habitual grace. And I picked these two because the lives of both of them are very similar in that you have a man who encounters a vulnerable child who then he leads 
uh, who, after the encounter, strives to protect the life of the child. So that's kind of the comparison. Okay, so let's start with actual grace. So what is actual grace? Actual grace is um, a single experience of God's love that changes us. How does it change us? Well, it, it reflects those three ideas we spoke about in the Trinity. It leads to openness, relationship, and justice. So I'm going to describe for you a little bit about the story of the Mandalorian. And as I go through it, keep your ear out for the ideas of openness, relationship, and justice. So if you haven't had a chance to watch the Mandalorian series, it is, I really like it. Like it, the first, there's two seasons to it. The first season takes a little while to kind of get going, but when the second season starts rolling, it is awesome, especially if you like Star Wars. So this is basically what happens. So the, the Mandalorian is a hardened bounty hunter who spends his life um, capturing people or, to be honest, bringing their lives to a conclusion for money. So the Mandalorian, he um, is commissioned by this mysterious client to go and find a 50-year-old person and he's given very vague instructions um, and a tracker to hunt down this person. And as his reward, he's given something called Beskar, which is a type of metal that the Mandalorians honor and have tremendous respect for uh, because, it's, because a Mandalorian is not like the bounty hunter way of life, isn't just a job, it's more like a religion. And so as part of this religion, the Mandalorian always wears a mask and his face is never revealed to other people. And he also never breaks a deal with someone that he makes. So he's given this uh, person to find and the reward of Beskar if he accomplishes it. He takes the tracker, he flies in his uh, spaceship to another planet and eventually is able to hunt down this person and when he finally encounters the person it's discovered that it is a child or what looks like the baby Yoda and this is very unexpected the bounty hunter is like what is this but you know he's a hardened bounty hunter and who has a job to do so he takes the child and manages eventually to get off the planet and return the child to the client and receives his best car at first, he's like kind of wondering, you know, what is the client going to do? But the client doesn't say what his plan for the child is. But the Mandalorian starts to have some doubts. Nevertheless, he takes his Beskar and he leaves and he goes and encounters um, other members of the Mandalorian clan and says, you know, I completed this great task and I have all this wonderful Beskar. And when they ask a few more questions about what he was up to and where he got this best car from, they begin to criticize him because they say, you know, this client that you work for, he probably played a role in the destruction of our home world and that's how he got this best car. Like, why did you work with him? But, you know, it was a job that needed to be done and he did it and he got the best car and that's what mattered. So, of course, after like having getting the Beskar and now he's kind of added to his armor that is made of Beskar he goes on to his next job and he gets uh, go, goes to this kind of pub area gets the, the the next bounty he's seeking or looking for and he's flying away and as he's flying away something really interesting happens he suddenly stops turns his spaceship around and goes back to the planet to where he left the um, baby Yoda. He breaks into the compound where the baby Yoda is being held, blasts away all the guards, frees the baby Yoda and takes him in his spaceship and they flee. And because of this, this action of the Mandalorian, he's broken a code of the, Ma of the Mandalorian 
in that he broke a deal that uh, he had with the client. And as a result, he has to spend the rest of his life kind of on the run as a result of this. But the Mandalorian then spends the rest of the series protecting the child and acting in the child's best interest. So hopefully if I've, I didn't want to spoil the whole um, program for you, I left out some pretty big details, but my summary hopefully captures three ideas that the Mandalorian, who's a hardened bounty hunter, is normally cut off to other people and to relationships. He doesn't really care about other people. But then he has this moment of what we would call actual grace. Actual grace is a single moment of experiencing God's love that changes us. And how does it change us? Well, it makes us open to others just as suddenly the Mandalorian begins to care about the baby Yoda. Leads to greater relationship. You can see through the series of how the Mandalorian cares about the, the baby Yoda and his well-being and is willing to risk his life to keep him safe. And through the rest of the series, spends a lot of time and effort trying to reunite the baby Yoda with other Jedi. And then finally, Justice, the Mandalorian who has participated in serious injustice throughout his life, um, works to bring justice for the baby Yoda and help him to uh, flourish and be safe. So, like I'm, on one level, the Disney Plus series of Mandalorian is awesome because it's like Star Wars, but the, what I find really interesting about it is this theme of actual grace that the Mandalorian experienced at that one moment while he's flying away and suddenly changes the whole direction of his life. And that leads to the question then, have you ever had a moment of actual grace in your life? So I'd like to just give you a few moments to kind of ponder. Have you ever had a moment where suddenly you just change the direction of your life because if you have that was God's love if and especially if it led to greater openness relationship and justice for others and yourself So now let's talk about habitual grace. Habitual grace is the permanent disposition 
to say yes to God's call in one's life. So in the life of the Mandalorian, the Mandalorian had a single moment of grace that redirected his life, opened him up to this new relationship with the uh, baby Yoda, but there are still lots of his life that does not reflect the call of God's love. In contrast, we have St. Joseph, who no matter what seems to come about, responds with holiness. And I want to zero in on this because this habitual grace, this, this constant yes that St. Joseph is called upon to give and, and does so with generosity, reminds me of you and your work that you do for our young people. Um, so as I go through the life of St. Joseph and we see, you know, kind of speak about the, the ups and downs, the trials and difficulties that he is called upon to respond to, I suspect that you will kind of see yourself reflected in his need to respond with those hallmarks of the Trinity of openness, relationship, and justice so that the love of God can shine through. So the story of St. Joseph, um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, begins with St. Joseph engaged to Mary, and he's a carpenter, and he's planning to live a, a relatively calm, uneventful life. Um, and then suddenly it is discovered that Mary is with child. And that must have been just crushing to St. Joseph um, because they had been promised to be, you know, married to one another. And then from his perspective, it's, you know, I'm sure he took the interpretation of, well, clearly Mary has eyes for another. Um, and St. Joseph responds to this situation with great, well, with those hallmarks of the Trinity of, of, of justice and relationship and openness because he he once he resolves to end the relationship quietly so that Mary's reputation isn't harmed no harm comes to her as a result of this situation and he just he just he, he acts in her best interest but then saint joseph has a dream um, what we call a sort of theophany when god speaks to us and says joseph the child that Mary has conceived in her womb is there by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you, God asks that you take Mary as your wife and raise the child and name him Jesus. And what, and what does St. Joseph do? He says yes. But he's saying yes to a new plan for his life. Like he thought he was going to get married, live a relatively sort of regular life, then that was off, that marriage, then he was like back to being single, and now it's the marriage is back on, but he's called to live a marriage in which he is a, not only a stepfather, but also lives a life of celibacy. And that's a pretty big ask. Um, and yet St. Joseph says yes, but it doesn't end there. Shortly after the child is born, Herod, who is the local authority in the area, feels threatened by the, the, the birth of, a, of this newborn king and sends out people to try to destroy the child. So now St. Joseph is called upon to, be, um, to protect the Holy Family, Mary and the child Jesus, and they flee to um, Egypt to escape this attack and they have to wait out um, Herod until he passes away and it's interesting to see the contrast between the Mandalorian and Mandalorian and Joseph like Joseph responds to threats of violence in a nonviolent way Saint jo the Mandalorian not so much then Saint Joseph like um, cares for the Holy Family in Egypt, and once the threat is over, returns to um, the Holy Land, but
But then, like, things are a little uncertain, so he has to move and settle in Nazareth. And after that, the story goes quiet for many, many years. But when you look at the life of St. Joseph, you see these constant shifts and change that come. And each time he says, yes, he responds with holiness. He acts in a way that is open to God's call in his life, leads to greater relationship and helps create justice uh, for the Blessed Virgin Mary, the child Jesus, and undoubtedly for everyone else that, G that Joseph encountered because he is a person of holiness. And this is why we hold him in such high regard. But this same holiness that Joseph demonstrates of saying, yes to God's plan, to being a disciple of God's love in the world is what you do. Consider even just the last year, how many like shifts had you, have you experienced and had to say, okay, yes to this. Oh, we're changing now. Okay. Yes to this over here. Okay. Yes to this. And you're doing this as you try to care for our young people, create a sense of normalcy and peace and justice for them because our young people are afraid. And I'm sure at many points you were afraid too, just like St. Joseph would have been. But we always, you know, you act in the best interests of the young people that God has entrusted to our care. So I would like to give you a few minutes just to kind of ponder not only like the last year, but your career as a teacher of, of working with Edmonton Catholic schools and to see how when these major shifts come, whether it be changing school or having to teach a different grade, how did you say yes to that? I invite you to examine this experience and say, where was the Holy Spirit in that moment? How did I, how did the Trinity reach out to me and help me to say yes to this, this trial and this difficulty in the same way that St. Joseph did. I'd now like to talk a little bit about sacramental grace. So in our discussion on actual and habitual grace, when we try to see where those moments are in our lives, it tends to be a reflective exercise. We look at the past and try to see, you know, where did God stir me to the call of love? 
But then it's natural to say, well, what about the future? Like, where will God appear in the rest of my life? Um, or questions like, well, where is God in my life now? When, when will I encounter God? This is where the sacraments are so important because the sacraments are experiences of God's love that we can anticipate in that whenever we see a baptism or you know, participate in a baptism, uh, reconciliation, Eucharist, confirmation, anointing of the sick, a marriage or an ordination, we know for sure that God's love is there. And it is that grace is helping to transform that person to live a life of greater love that imitates and expresses the love of the Trinity. And my favorite uh, sacrament of all of them is baptism. I love doing a baptism because it's like the joy of weddings without the paperwork. <laughs> and I often find that the Holy Spirit works through baptisms to help yeah to to like raise my spirits more more than once like when i've been having a hard day or a rough time it just seems that the a whole a, a baptism has been fit into my schedule so that when i go and i meet the family and we baptize the child i'm like this is awesome when i when i reflect upon my life when i look at the the moments of actual and habitual grace in my life, baptisms come up over and over again. And I know whenever I can anticipate experiencing that moment, whenever I see I have a baptism scheduled uh, in my, um, my life as a priest. So when we look at baptisms, though, it's very clear to see how these aspects of openness, relationship, and justice appear in baptism. A baptism starts when the Holy Spirit stirs parents or guardians or someone who wants to join the Catholic faith to, to, to something more. They're like, there's something missing. I want a greater relationship. And so either they like bring their, for, their child forth to, re, to be baptized or people can join through the RCIA program, which is the Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults. And when we when they complete the preparation class and they come forward to be baptized and I have the profound privilege to take the water and to baptize them by pouring the water in the head and saying I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit something amazing happens now I'm not talking about like lights come down from heaven and voices and angels but at that moment that child is now a child of God in that they have become the brother or sister of Jesus. And not only are they the brothers and sisters of Jesus, they are the brothers and sisters now of everyone else who has been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But the, the call of relationship doesn't end just there. God, through baptism, reminds each of us of the unique dignity that we all have as, being, as persons made in the likeness and image of God. And not just me, but everyone. And so we are given a gift of profound beauty through baptism to realize that we are called to live a life of, of justice that honors the beauty of each and every person as a unique thought of God a thought of love. This is why I love doing baptisms and I look forward to seeing not only to doing baptisms themselves but all the sacraments. So up to this point we've covered three types of grace. Actual grace, habitual grace, and sacramental grace. There's one more kind of grace called charism but it, um, I will cover that at another time. So now there's one spiritual theme that I'd like to draw upon before we conclude today, and that is the theme of the vulnerable. What do I mean by that? Well, there is a tendency of God to work through 
the vulnerable to get to us, to help us to encounter God's love. So you saw it in the life of the Mandalorian and St. Joseph, where you have an infant child who is vulnerable, and the relationship of being in, you know, or the, the interaction of being in relationship with that child becomes a means of God's grace in the life of the Mandalorian and St. Joseph. The same occurs in our lives, where God will often use vulnerable people who have been entrusted to our care to help us to grow in the life of holiness. And this is something that you do all the time. Like you work with vulnerable young people, whether they be the kindergarten kids at a very hundred voices at a very young age, or even our teenagers who are, you know, they have adult bodies, but inside they are vulnerable people who need care and guidance and, and protection. So I'd like to share with you an interview I did with uh, Muando, who is the new um, director of L'Arche Edmonton. And I'm a board member with L'Arche Edmonton. And working with L'Arche and the persons with disabilities that L'Arche um, helps to give to community to um, has been a wonderful experience in my life. And so I wanted to ask Mwanda, who spent, I think, about 15 years in L'Arche, about her work with the vulnerable and how that has changed her. Okay, so hello, uh, my name is Mwando. I am uh, the new director for L'Arche Association of Edmonton. And uh, I've been with the community for uh, about 15 years, going on 16 years now. And um, um, I would like to share today about how uh, supporting people with disabilities um, and supporting people that are vulnerable has changed my life. With people with disabilities, it's it's um, it's it, it's not hidden. Uh, they they present who they are, um, and and they present themselves to you as they as they as they are, and you you either accept that or you or you don't. Um, there is no filter. There is no covering up. And um, the other thing too is um, I have learned that um, for people with disability, vulnerability is different from. Uh, them being weak. Yes, they are vulnerable in the sense that sometimes they can be easily taken for granted or sometimes they can be um, exploited or abused and uh, sometimes they need help in the day-to-day -day activities. They need support in activities of daily life, but that does not make them weak. Actually, far from it. Um, uh, I lived with a woman years back. Her name was Patricia. She passed away. And um, around the time that I started living with her, she had just been diagnosed with dementia. And um, she, so, so, so lots of things were changing in her life, which obviously when somebody's uh, life has changed that much and they are experiencing dementia and hallucinations and not aware of what they are aware about, it does make them vulnerable. But she was, um, her character was still very much alive. So she experienced all of those changes in her life but her character was very much alive. And I was a new assistant in this house where she lived. And um, so she would wander uh, around in the house and somehow she always ended up in my, in my room. Um, it was one of the things about Larsh Edmonton or Larsh in general is that we, we have um, live-in assistants. So when we come to Larsh, we live in a home. And so, um, so every time I wasn't in my room and I, if I am uh, somewhere else in the house or if I've gone to my days off or my time off and I would come back, she'd be in my room laying in my bed. <laughs> I ended up creating one of the best friendships with her. Um, so through her vulnerability and maybe her not knowing where she is and somehow always ending up in my room, uh, we ended up making a connection. Um, and um, I, I cared for her and supported for her up until she, she, she passed away. I have also found that um, if, if I am able to connect, if I want to connect with people, I have to let them really see who I, who I am. And people with disabilities, they, they do let you see who they truly are. And I think they, they, op they open the door then for me to be who I truly am with them and to be able to build that relationship with them. Um, and I can't, I can't show my true self to, to them and then, then not everybody else. So I, I found it opened the door for me 
to say there are some things about me that maybe I don't like or that are not perfect. But um, in order for me to connect with other people and to build those relationships, I need to let them see me. Um, I always uh, now always think, you know, if I have friends, I have relationships with people. If I have never seen them in difficult times, if I have never seen them when they are struggling, if I have never seen them when they are really in their most imperfect, uh, then can I truly say that I know them? Um, and I feel like with, with people with disabilities, you know who they, who they are because they show you um, and they let it come out. And also they trust that they will show you who they truly are and you will still be able to build relationships with them. But one of the things that I have learned is their vulnerability does not require sympathy because they are very strong people. What it requires is empathy. Uh, in order for me to be empathetic to them, I need to accept who they are and I need to accept who I am also in that relationship. People with disabilities are, 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 are strong people. They are, they are not looking for, for me to sympathize with them. They have full meaningful lives. They contribute to society. They contribute to my life. They have mutual relationships with people. Um, and therefore, I often don't feel that there is something to seem to be to be to feel sorry for them about. Uh, but instead, maybe there's areas, yeah, that make them vulnerable, and um, areas that they struggle because maybe life does not look exactly the same uh, for them as it would for somebody who does not have a disability. But um, so I can I can empathize with that. But I do I I, I find myself now not feeling sorry, but instead. Um, saying, okay, so th some of the areas are, are areas of struggle, but if we are making sure that people have full, full lives, they are engaged and they are valued, then sympathy is not, um, is not what is needed. I see, you know, like, yeah, I, yeah, I can empathize with where you're at and um, things like that. So, so that's, that's what I, I have discovered about, about vulnerability. And I've found myself more comfortable with, with the word and with the emotions that come with, um, with, being, with being vulnerable and uh, being okay with that, with that discomfort, but also like the self-awareness that comes with it of knowing that, yeah, if I, if I, am, if I am vulnerable, it's going to be uncomfortable. Like if I do certain things, it will be uncomfortable, but that moment will pass and we'll move on to something else. And, um, and there would be growth that comes out of that. There will be connection with other people. There will be the opportunity for people to really to really know me and for, for, for them to not judge my character, but to just say, ah, that's Mwando. <laughs> and, uh, and, and life goes on and the relationship goes on. Thank you so much, Mwando, for sharing about your experience of persons with disabilities through your wonderful work with Larsh Edmonton. We wish you all the best as part of your uh, continued service to them as the new leader of their community. So my friends, today we covered three major topics. First, we started with our meditation using the Rublev icon to learn more about the Trinity and how the Trinity is marked by three key ideas, openness, relationship, and justice. And these ideas underpin the communion of love that is the love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But that love of the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son is not closed off. It, God wishes to share it with all of us. And that's what led to our meditation about grace. Uh, we focused on three kinds of grace. We talked about actual grace, a, a single moment of experiencing God's love that brought about a conversion in the life of the Mandalorian. Then we talked about a habitual grace in which St. Joseph always responded with holiness, no matter what trial or difficulty uh, came his way. He just had the habit of living in accordance with God's will. And then last we, we talked about sacramental graces, which are experiences of God's love um, that we receive through the church, whether it be uh, starting with baptism, which we focused on primarily, but all the other uh, sacraments that help us in our journey of faith to grow in our relationship with the communion of love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then to conclude, we had Moando share of her experience of persons who are normally viewed to be vulnerable, but she really highlighted how they have 
a tremendous inner strength to be transparent, to be open to, to others and to invite us into a deeper relationship with them. Um, a training that helps, help us, helps us to be who we really are, uh, not only with persons with disabilities, but with everyone in our lives. So my friends, thank you so much for your time today. I really I hope this video gave you some insight about the Trinity and the ex your experiences of God's love that you may have had in your own life and how God tends to work through, well, many aspects of our life, but tends to zero in and wonderfully work through persons the vulnerable to help us to grow in faith and love and charity. So before we close with a prayer, I invite you to take a look at the email in which this uh, link came for today's video. The Religious Education Services has put forth uh, a series of activities that you can do to help close out our afternoon together. I hope that they draw you deeper into the communion of love and learning about God's actions of grace in your own life. Let us conclude with a prayer dedicated to the Trinity, the glory be. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us remain in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.